normal people caught up in certain situations can commit monstrous deeds. The deeds were monstrous, but the man himself is not a monster. Why does this country go about its business in the face of a president whose behavior can be characterized as radically evil to the well-being of the country and perhaps even the world? The power of ideological certainty today is really heavily driven by a fear of loneliness. They're just meeting people and asking them what is truth, what is white and what is black. It's great, but you know, just be careful, don't be executed like Socrates. I am not a monster. Action! I am Nelly Benayoun. I run a tuition-free university called the University of the Underground. I decided to find the origin of knowledge and bring it back to my students in my suitcase. What is knowledge? Who owns our thoughts? Can a monster think? Am I a monster? Are you a monster? For this journey, I have a partner in crime. Her name was Anna Arendt. She is dead. She was a political theorist. To meet you, what an honor. Thank you. <laughs> you go, you go here. I think, you know, Anna Arendt and her philosophy is very much a part of like all my conversation with every single thinker we meet. I see. And I'm impersonating her. So, I see. as you can see. Oh, is that what you were thought? This yeah. is, uh, I mean, I, did you recognize the outfit or not at well, all? Well, now I, now I know what you're talking about, although, you know, I knew, of course I knew her. That's not the way I would see her dress. Um, I met her in 1972 in April. Um, she was invited to speak at, the, uh, at my uh, college, mm -hmm. not by me. At that time, I was not really interested in her work. Anna Arendt is a political theorist? No, or? I think that Hannah Arendt, Is yes. she dead? Is she alive? Oh, well, Hannah Arendt. I mean, all, right. you know, like, just really the basics, because we need to cover the basics, and then we can go in. Uh, yeah. Like, and if you were to go back to the basic of the basics. Well, OK. Physically, we know that she's born in 1906. Who is she? Hannah Arendt is born in 1906 and dies in 1975. When she died, uh, there were, she had some admirers and people who were Now, in the beginning, in the second decade of the our uh, uh, century, I think she's increasingly recognized as one of the most important political thinkers of the 20th century. If we see what's happening, not just in the United States, but throughout the world, the move to authoritarianism, the uses of propaganda, uh, the, atten the systematic lying that's taking place, the disregarding of fact. These are all things that she pointed out as being characteristic of, uh, for her, the 20th century. And when she ends her, when Hannah Arendt ends her book on uh, the origins of totalitarianism, she says that the totalitarian regimes like Hitler and Stalin may end, but the temptation to use totalitarian means mm. will persist. And I think that's the world that we're living in today. When it comes to ideology, yeah. and, you know, our understanding of how an ideology takes shape yes. and forms. Yes. Um, I'm really intrigued, and that's also a part of, you know, as an educator and running a attrition-free university, like yeah. this whole notion of developing a form of education that in itself perhaps develop also a form of ideology. No. Ideology for her is always a negative term. For her, it's not a question of good ideologies and bad ideology. An ideology for her becomes a kind of system, which is it had a kind of consistent system that tries to explain everything. 
Ideology involves a certain kind of unanimity. Everybody thinking in the same sort of way, everybody adopting the same type of procedure. So she's very critical of the notion of ideology. So how should I address you? Should I address you, you as Lord? If you like, you personally, I would say, call me Imagine. And I think people call me Imagine. But the official title yeah. is He's Right Worshipful. Uh, <laughs> the official title is He's Right Worshipful, First Citizen, the Lord Mayor of Sheffield, Council of Majid. But I don't expect people to call me that. You should call me Majid. So welcome to Sheffield Town Hall. Yes. I'll briefly just explain this. So this is called the Ante Room, A-N-T-E Room. So this is the portraits of all the All Lord Mayors. But this is the first one we've got a picture of. Yeah. It goes before this, but this is the first time we've got a picture. And all these are just former Lord Mayors. And for me, when I kind of came in here, I thought, well, this picture that I have is going to outdate me. Well past I'm dead, this picture will always be there, right? So I'm looking, I'm like, they don't tell a story. Or well, you can say they tell a story that everybody was the same, maybe. But for me, it was like, it would have been so beautiful if every picture told a specific story of their time or just, just told a story in some sense, right? So I was like, right, I'm going to do mine completely different. I'm going to bring my own photographer in. I went a bit different, right? The council and the establishment lost their shit. They're like, you come in here, you want to break tradition. Like, what's the point of you being Lord Mayor? You're going to ruin everything. But they didn't understand why I was doing what they're doing. But they, I always find establishments and certain people and hierarchies, they always say, but we've always done it like this. That's not an excuse to say we've always done it like this. We had traditions, we had a tradition where women weren't allowed to vote. That was a tradition, you know what I'm saying? Traditions come and go, you learn new things mm. and you realise that was some dumb, stupid shit we used to do and you educate yourself and you move forward, right? Mm. But sometimes people are scared of change. And that was taken just here, yeah, right? This was, yeah, this was taken downstairs in the print. And you picked as well the frame, I'm guessing, and everything yes. else? Yes, so basically what happens is you start off in colour and when you finish you go back, you go to black and white. <laughs> so basically, like, everything I'm wearing, like, I kind of chose, because I, I kind of wanted to kind of like give off the impression I'm serious, yeah. but at the same time, I'm here to do things differently. Yeah. That's why I'm wearing like my, my boots. Like, so everything I kind of thought of. So this room is a full council room. It's called council chamber. So the main purpose use of it is once a month, the first Wednesday of every month, we hold the council meeting. This is where people debate, all the councillors, elected councillors debate. This is where we pass motions and policies that affect everybody in Sheffield. In this room there, and when you're coming in, you've got a lady called, it's a lady, but it's a lady, it's called a mace bearer. So the lady who's a mace bearer, yep. she has this on the shoulder and kind of walks and goes, please upstanding. But no decisions can be made without this present in the city. All be upstanding for his right worship for Lord Mayor, Council Mayor, and then everybody stand up. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm wearing a t-shirt that says Donald Trump is a waste man and a sombrero. And I remember, because I'm human at the end of the day, so I'm a bit nervous. I'm like, oh my God, am I actually going to go and chair this meeting? And I kind of walk in, I'm like, please be seated. And everybody says that. And I just get into the meeting very serious. Kind of get, and in my head I'm thinking, what the fuck's going on? But for me it was to make the point. But then, and then I kind of talked about what I was doing, yeah, what I was yeah, doing, of and yeah, kind of yeah. think. So this is just like, it's very, it's a bit of a pantomime. It's like people arguing, it gets really dramatic and like, you got people from the gallery saying shame. It's just like really, it's, it's, it's quite something, but it's very passionate. I came to Sheffield when I was five years old. Mm. Came as refugees, couldn't speak any English, couldn't do anything, but then when you're a child, you adapt things very, very quickly and went to school here, did everything here. But even as a child, I, I remember actually when I grew up, I wanted to be an elephant. But then I quickly realized, well, you, know, you 
can't be an elephant. And then if I want to be an astronaut, I wanted it. But then I never really knew properly what I wanted to do. So if you were to tell me I was going to be a lawyer, I was like, Psh, impossible. So I always, people always ask me who, growing up, who was your role model? Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say I had a specific person. For me, the role model was the internet. So I would literally use the internet. For, if I was feeling down, I'd be on the internet for, to look, look, learn, for like cheering myself up or learning anything. So every time, the internet was everything to me because even though I was living in a small part of Sheffield, yeah. it was the whole world. So I would go to the internet and that's where I just, my source of knowledge for me was the internet. Where is the source of knowledge? Yeah. It was the people, the wealthy people that decided the future and the education of other people. But now the amazing thing is we don't have to rely on rich people. We've got sources like the internet and so many other ways to gain knowledge. Whereas before, knowledge you can say was limited. Like you have to go out your way to go and find knowledge. You can only like, that's why you hear crazy stories of people traveling and to what just to gain knowledge. But I think Sheffield's got a history of like radical history and like political radicalism. So, for example, the suffragette movement, women getting the vote in the UK, started in Sheffield. Mm. The first women's suffrage society was in, based in Sheffield. And then you've got like even a lady called Mary Ann Rawson who helped and um, abolish slave, the slave trade in the UK. I think one of the reasons, if I'm being honest with you, I have gathered so much attention is because it's down to a failed democracy. By that, what I mean is, if you look at all forms of government, local government to national government, the people who are there to lead as and represent us do not reflect the people that they're meant to represent. So for example, look at the government, our government, the cabinet members, they are all millionaires. How on earth are they meant to really understand child poverty? They've never experienced How are they really meant to understand the benefit that the arts bring to deprived communities because they've never been, they've just had everything accessible to them easily. One of the ways to re control and have power is make everyone else stupid so they haven't got enough knowledge power to really take control. Because if everybody really understood that the power is with the majority and not the minority, we can easily overturn things. But if you're at the top and you want to remain at the top, one of the methods you'd use is make everybody else not so smart. Political thinkers are really important because they introduce one idea or one theme which is basic. The theme that Arendt introduces that is fundamental to all her thinking is plurality. And plurality, she means each of us is born into the world, has a different perspective on it. Politics, there's no politics without plurality. And this is why much of what we would call politics today is for her a disaster. And the attempt to get unanimity of opinion kills politics, it kills plurality. This is a deep, deep theme in Arendt's thinking that there is no, the, the human, when she speaks about the condition for action, political action, it's plurality. It gives me great pleasure to hereby declare that the great city of Sheffield has voted in favour of having a tuition free, free university and free education for every single citizen in Sheffield. <laughs> you talk about the internet as being the place where you know we can kind of share or at least communicate a certain form of knowledge from a generation to another. The ancient form of Homo sapiens or Neanderthal basically didn't need the internet to actually share their knowledge. Oh, no, 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 it's just the internet is just the newest step yeah. in the path. And it's just an amazing step. 
right? Because not only is it a mechanism of moving information around, there are computers in the mix, yeah. right? And these computers are starting to become interesting. We, we, we wanted to make it so that people would turn to their machine to answer questions. Just even in, in the 80s, this was a radical idea. And then we wanted to make everyone into a publisher. It felt like a radical idea. Now these things are, are commonplace. It's what we, just, it's what we do. Um, so where does it go from here? Um, how do we go and make it so that everybody's ideas that are worth propagating yeah, propagate yeah. to the right places and yeah. are preserved in the right ways? Um, and we build on and keep the diversity of the wackiness that people are. So this is the headquarters of the Internet Archive. And... Um, so these are people that are dedicating their lives towards going and making information permanently available to anybody anywhere for free. So we don't charge for anything. Uh, the idea is to try to live and build the, that internet ideal of universal access to all knowledge. We digitize 1,000 books every day. 1,000 books. books. But how many machines like this do you have? Hundreds. And we're digitizing in many different countries. Uh, so we go and we find what are the things that, that should live. What are the, the family matters? Two centuries of families of law in Ontario, Canada. And who make a choice on which bits should go first? Often it's the libraries uh, do, and they pay us 12 cents a page. Uh, and then we digitize them and they make them available. Um, or people donate them to us and we want one copy of everything ever published. <laughs> These are servers of the Internet Archive. Mm. It's about 10 petabytes of data. It goes mega, giga, tera, peta. Mm. This is 10 petabytes on both sides out of the 40 petabyte collection of the Internet Archive. And the cool thing about this one is the lights actually mean something. Every time a light blinks, somebody is either uploading something or downloading something from the Internet Archive. I think of it like open stacks of a library. You know when you can go up to a library and you can pull the books in the, in the library? Yes. Um, but this is even better. You can see the book is being read by somebody in the world. Do right? you just sit here sometime and just... Oh, yeah. Isn't it beautiful? Is it 24 hours? Always. What happens when there is no electricity booster? It goes dark. And? Nobody has access to this copy. Fortunately, we have another copy that's in Richmond, California, and we have a partial copy in Amsterdam and a partial copy in Alexandria, Egypt. For real. So these... Who are these people? All these people, they're us. They're us. So these are people that have spent their lives building the Internet Archive. It's like the terracotta soldiers from Xi'an, China, right? These, if you work for the Archive for three years, we make a little statue. That's me. This is just, there's more and more and more and more, right? These are just... More supercomputers. This is the internet. This is the World Wide Web. Universal access, access to, to all, all knowledge. knowledge. What does that mean? So what we, build, mean we started universal? building this collection to try to be a basic core archive that could then be built into a library that then people could use for their education, for journalism, for dreaming, for... And then we wanted to take that work and put it back in. So it's just this cycle back through. What do you think about VR? How do you use it? How would you use it? Who would you pull into the space? Um, you know, what do you think are the technical applications, the educational applications, the professional applications? If you had to pull a group together to think about the future of this technology, who would you include in that group? Um, yeah, what do you think are the strengths and what are the pitfalls? Um, what about Google? Like, she died before Google. What would she think about Google? Don't you want to ask that? Anna! 
Yes, you don't know about this. VR, as in virtual reality, is an interactive computer-generated experience that usually you will enter this virtual world by putting some goggles on. AR, as in augmented reality, is when there is some digital element that add themselves to our reality through the lens of a camera or a smartphone. I hope that makes sense. If you think about Google's core mission, it's you know, organizing the world's information in a useful way um, and in a universal accessible way. Mm. And oftentimes we viewed VR as making experiences more accessible. Um, so I would say we refer less to knowledge and more to information. And I do think that if you look at AR, for example, AR is adding um, intelligent layers onto reality. Like, can we help guide you to understand your world using this technology? Mm. And that comes with a lot of responsibility. You can do a lot of powerful things with these technologies, and so now is the time to be building these use cases and see how people are using it. I mean, do we consider VR as being kind of the future, where the future is heading for Google, or, or not? VR, AR, immersive technologies, it's like giving people superpowers, right? It's like, I can take you anywhere. I can bring anything to you. I can translate things in real time. I can, so it's, it's, it's sort of like uh, embellishing things that you already do, but making mm. them even more powerful. Um, and that takes way more than one team, right? Like one dream I have is like, could we recreate a zoo in VR so that you don't have to have real zoos? Like maybe, maybe kids could go to the zoo and see the giraffes so that the giraffes could live in the wild and they just get to see them in VR and they can even get really close to them. So yes, in a way it is about knowledge and like bringing that knowledge to you and helping you add intelligent layers to what you're looking at and things like that. And so in this context, what is education then? I think Hannah Arendt, the best characterization of her is an independent thinker. In German, a self-stinker. She did not belong to any school. She was not a Marxist. She was not a liberal. I think one of the reasons why Hannah Arendt is enjoying such a renaissance now, as ideologies fall apart, one can see fresh thinking, OK? Um, and there are many aspects of Arendt which to some people will seem radical mm. and to other people will seem conservative. Mm. In one respect, she was very conservative about education. She thought that people have to be well-educated in terms of a need, and that really, education should be separate from politics. This is a model of the 1949 British economy, invented by Bill Phillips and Walter Newlin. And it's, there's a metaphor about money and water. You have income streams, cash flows, liquidity, siphoning off, etc. And this isn't just a metaphor, though. This is actually an analog computer mm. that takes that metaphor and actually calibrates it. So there will be water flowing through here, and the water represents the money, the flow of money in the economy. And we cannot, like, fast forward to where we are now? A little bit. It ran into problems in the 1970s when they had this stagflation, because this doesn't actually model inflation. Let's look at I'll switch it how on. that works. Water goes and then you and I can make a machine for knowledge as well. Sure. No, that would be really good. I'd like that. Ready? Yes. So who pays for university education? Now, it used to be that the government would pay, but they don't want to... They want to shut this one down. So what they decided to do is we're, we're going to shut this down and make the students pay. So the students now have to pay. But the students haven't got any money. So how do the students get the money? The government borrows it from the bank along here, from the student loan company, and then pushes it back along there and puts it through there. So instead of it coming through here, it now goes through there. So it has no effect on the economy whatsoever. All the government has done is hidden the national debt in the bank accounts of the students. And so tell me if we were to do this machine for knowledge, thinking in terms of the stakeholders of knowledge, which are a bit different than the economy, isn't it? It's a really interesting idea, uh, knowledge. Shall we try and make some mapping of that? 
Richard, let's try. imagine. The way I would possibly do it is I would start with sort of, for, the, so for this one, I'd start with birth, and then death at the bottom. Yes. And I'd have like a big waterfall, so lots of sort of people are sort of being born, and they're sort of falling down this machine, and eventually they sort of die. But in the middle, this is the sort of school age, then there's the sort of university age, and then there's the sort of work. So when you get down here now, some of these people are employed, some are unemployed, and some of these are employed. These are at the university, the creation of knowledge. Who's paying for it? We've already looked at who's paying. So now I have to have my Phillips machine with its, all its flows of the Phillips machine. But it's interesting because you are thinking of using the Philips machine and sticking that one into the Philips machine? Well, this is, this is, so because yes, I this is a parallel to do file. an independent one. This is an independent Philips machine, but they're coupled. The they're economics coupled. is coupled to the, to the knowledge. Okay. They're all coupled together. Why are they coupled together? Because who's paying, who's paying for the universities? Who's, who's got all the money at the moment? It's Google, it's the Knowledge Society, the Information Society. There's a big link between knowledge and economics. Do you think it's always been like that, knowledge and economics related to yes, each other? Yes, definitely. So I mean, it's obvious to an engineer that the Industrial Revolution was far more important than the French Revolution. You know, from our perspective, the, the wealth that came from the Industrial Revolution. So knowledge is directly connected to economics? That's Yes. So basically, if I was to bring back something to my students? Water, yes. Water, because for two reasons. One, it's absolutely, you are mostly water. We need water. Water is the starting point of everything. And it's also a metaphor for just about everything as well. So it's physically, so it all starts with water. There is this belief that you know, education and knowledge are separate completely from economics. Yes. And that is something that I'm questioning. I, I think one of, yeah. I think that she was so concerned to make people aware, that Hannah Arendt was aware of the, what could be the dignity of politics, and not just in an utopian way, because she thought that the the, the kind of politics and what she sometimes would call public freedom took place. It took place in the Greek polis, it took place in the American Revolution, it took place in the Paris Commune. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not something which is just uh, a utopian idea. It has existed and it can exist again mm -hmm. if people create it. But in her emphasis, to underscore the dignity and the distinctiveness of politics, she sometimes draws a very sharp distinction between polit what she calls the political and the social. Mm. And she puts economics into the social, you see, so that she makes too great a separation between politics and, and economics. And my own criticism mm. of a rent would be if you want to take your idea, Arendt's idea of politics, action, plurality, and seriously, then you have to be deeply concerned with the economic conditions that make that possible, you see. So that's like an internal criticism, and I think this was a blind spot for her. <laughs> Lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you too. Uh, so this is our school. Uh, this is. Um, yes. We're on the ground floor. There's no kids here at the moment because they're yeah. all upstairs. Um, we just came back from, oh, there you go, my summer camp um, from last week. So they're doing like a reflection writing piece about yeah, the yeah. summer camp upstairs. So shall we yeah, go yeah. up? We do, we do, we do, 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 we, we, I commit to you. We do, we do, we do, do, we, transition to me. 
one of the things that came up is how is your school different from other schools? Yeah. I think one of the main features of our school is it's a, it's a concept-based curriculum. It's not an activities-based curriculum. We want the kids to absorb and to be able to appreciate concepts, to connect ideas, and as you said before, like transdisciplinary. So being able to look at one problem from many, many different perspectives, gaining skills and ways of thinking in uh, in different areas and trying to see how they overlap, how they connect, how they relate to each other, how they are relevant to each other. Each year level has uh, free time at some point in the week. Um, free time is literally like they can do anything. We don't tell them what to do, they completely make up their own mind. And you know, they can just laze around and read a book, they can go outside to the park. Um, if they go outside, they go outside unsupervised. We trust that they're their own judgment. So, um, and it's just a really important time where they decide what happens. It's, it's almost 100% student-centred. We wanted to create a, like a different type of space, you know, and we saw people coming for an MFA degree spending a lot of money to come, you know, to New York to study. And we thought, okay, that's, that's crazy. We could do something shorter. We could do something more kind of intense, more ha sort of cross between a residency and a, and a boot camp. And, and, and we created this alternative thing, this thing that people come for 10 weeks and have, you know, very structured experience. And is there a reason why you decided not to do an accreditation with the school? Oh, because we... Because it's 10 weeks, but they don't leave with an MFA, which is the equivalent yeah. of a master. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're totally unofficial. So we don't, you know, we're not um, accredited. And we kind of, and that, you know, we do, we do it how we want to do it, you know. So um, we never went through that process. We, in our, the legal name of our school is SFPC. You can't have the word school in your legal name because you have to go through the Board of Education and we're real like alternative, like we're not, you know, we didn't, didn't go in those ways. So, um, so we're not, not accredited, but students leave with, with a lot. They don't leave with a degree, but they leave with a lot. Don't you think that if you look and you read an Arendt, one of the key takeaway perhaps yeah. is that education should exist separately from government? She thinks it's a disaster if the state dictates education, you know. Education for her should be a, a kind of private matter and a social matter, not a state political matter. The only role of the state that she would, would be, see is to ensure that it's public education. But what goes on in the classroom, what goes on in education, she thinks that politicians should stay out of that. How about the, um, uh, the students, uh, the demographic of the students? How does yeah. that work? Yeah, so they're mostly kind of college age or older. So we have students who are from like 20, you know, up to 50, 60. Like we've had students who are sort of mid-career professionals, a lot of times like taking a break from a job. Because it's 10 weeks, you know, you can, sometimes you can convince your boss to say like, I want to go for three months and study. Mm -hmm. My class is called Recreating the Past, and every week we talk about a different artist. So for example, Vera Molnar, who's a Hungarian artist, like based in Paris since the 70s, she was writing code to control a pen plotter mm -hmm. to make algorithmic drawings. Mm -hmm. So students ha study her work, but then also have to recreate one of her works using modern tools. Mm -hmm. And what I think the, I, what I think is quite beautiful is that they, they oftentimes, there's a gap. And that gap is really beautiful. We, and we talk about it and we, re, you know, we think about it. And for me, the poetry is in that, is in, and also in saying to students that the past is there to engage with. <laughs>
What is so special about the National Museum of Ethiopia? The National Museum is, uh, well, there are about four collections. Yeah. The most important is uh, archaeological and uh, the paleontological sections, uh, which you find uh, um, fossils of uh, human origins, the origins of life. So I'm going to find the origin of humans here. Yeah. I'm and not... and uh, you know that Ethiopia is the uh, land of origins. It is a source of human beings. We, we claim that because of the discoveries of Lucy and other communist international museum Hello. <laughs> very nice to meet you I, you do the i do this is we do, we do it in the south of France, in Lyon as well, three kisses. Chuk, chuk, chuk. Mm. And so you're the curator of the museum. Yeah, uh, I'm a curator of the uh, museum. We have two sections in the museum, yeah. our laboratory and the display here. So what we are going to see now is... Scientific cast of Lucy. The scientific cast of Lucy. Yeah. She's the first found fossil that was equipped with... BPD, like the, she could actually work. Yeah. Well, she's, uh, Lucy is unique because uh, she's found before 42 years ago, 1974. And they understand the first, uh, almost they found more than 40% of her body. And she gave detailed information about bipedalism, even uh, sex morphology, so many things. That's why she's unique. Even us. Uh, the research are still ongoing on her. Was she able to think, to produce yeah, thoughts? Yeah, she's around 500 cc brain size, but even the brain size, brain size is changed through time, through time. So she was able to formulate thinking? She was, yeah. The question I have is whether or not, you know, she was, she's the origin of knowledge, I guess. For us, yeah, because uh, she's the first for, uh, for us, for homo, uh, homo sapiens, sapien, or for modern human, she's the origin of knowledge because she's found almost so many years ago and she gave full information about this science. So she's the origin of knowledge for modern human. Lucy. You see, you are dead when you are young. I see your wisdom tools. I'm thinking you are dead during your young age. She's got, wi sorry, what? She, Lucy, wisdom tools. Ah, I'm so she was uh, young. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking about her biological age. You're thinking about her biological Lucy, Lucy, biological age. And she's dead at young age, yeah. maybe um, 18 something years. Well, it's really sad that you died that young. It's a lot of things that you couldn't see. But I'm, I have to tell you, Lucy, that I'm delighted that Meta Sebia and her colleagues found you a great friend. Friend? Artie. Your Artie, who is way older than you are, but one million years yes. before you. But at least you're not on your own. I think that's important too. Um, they sacrifice themselves for us as origin of knowledge. That's one version of it. Yeah. <laughs> Abrunya mialekas behi wat haftu insana ba kaguni sare ke miguas mikir misenik leman gadiguas tasfami honing sata mai rekeng. Ak her seherusen em at neb redit enef het neb jarsen er ab jetsen ber tu jeser tu ich enef sehen imsen iu hutu nechersen. We don't know the exact pronunciation. We, we have some clues because uh, Coptic, which is used even today in liturgy, is uh, basically the latest face of the Egyptian uh, language. Mm. But uh, we, we are not sure what was the, 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 the 
precise pronunciation mm. of each Egyptian language. And tell me a bit more about where, you know, where this Rosetta Stone was, was found? Yeah, it's called Rosetta Stone uh, because it was found in Rosetta. Do you have like uh, a map on this one? And then that's Rosetta. But yeah. then of course Champollion wasn't there. No, he wasn't there. No. So it's... It was found by, by um, one of the soldiers of Napoleon. Yeah. So he just found it and he already recognized the importance of this text. And later, after Napoleon was defeated, it became the property of the crown. What is being said here in the Rosetta yes. Stone? So that's actually the same text written uh, in different languages. This uh, text said that every temple should have a shrine, a special shrine with a special uh, statue of Ptolemy V, and this should be venerated. Is that uh, to say that basically communication really started with trade? And that, with was, a... that was the most important thing at the beginning, obviously. Just uh, if I send a product from one place to another yeah. one, I should, I should write the addresses or uh, the, the, the quantity or anything else on that. So that was the first user of, of the hieroglyphs and the symbols. Later, it was adapted for other purposes, of, obviously, from rituals. Uh, that was quite important on temples, for example. And and also for, for the purposes of the state. So do you know what the weight of the Rosetta Stone is? It's written in somewhere, but it's quite heavy. So I don't think it's easy to... Um, yeah, it's at 762 kilogram. Oh, wow. So it's not really easy okay. to move it. So yeah, because, you know, I want to bring it back to my, in my suitcase. And we have lots of copies in the, in the shop, so nice, tiny copies. I have, I... I have several at home, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> What is an iron definition of a monster? People think that if somebody does evil or monstrous de deeds, he or she must be a monster. And by a monster, sadistic, wanting to do evil for its own sake, perverted. Now, what she saw is that normal people caught up in certain situations can commit monstrous deeds. So she will say, the deeds were monstrous. They were ex you know, extreme, but the man himself is not a monster. And that's what you have to, and if you want to understand mm. evil in the 20th century, then you have to understand who people don't, they don't have to be psychotic. They don't have to be, uh, uh, you know, excluded from everything. They else they can be, in ordinary situations, normal bureaucrats. But caught up in certain situations, they can be involved in all kinds of deeds that are horrendous. What I propose in the following is a reconsideration of the human condition from the vantage point of our newest experiences and our most recent fears. What I propose, therefore, is very simple. It is nothing more than to think what we are doing. Hi, Nelly San. You take breath, deep breath, and then I count. 10 to 1, gradually your body is really relaxing. And I gradually did this door open, and I can reach their um, beliefs, usually suppressed, you can't see. When you are in the state of hypnosis, mm. their mind is open, the unconscious, unconscious mind is open, and connected to uh, kind of higher self, you can't say, um, or spirit, or uh, some kind of unlimited awareness. And then you can get answer. Yes. Can we try? <laughs> Three. I'm thinking. Two. I think I'm thinking freely. One, you can see something, I, or write, or 
images. Hey, Nelly, san. Hey, hey, please. Hey, hey. Eh, so. Please. どうぞ。どうぞ。はい。よろしくお願いします。愛しめまして。ファースト。全2クラップ。ネリさんのためにひねり出す俺の1区1歩1歩歩いていくこの道浅草橋まで来て東京 T.O.K.Y.O.地下水脈は絶え間なく循環慣れ字が3マンスうんザバースムースライカダーツオンハウマッチだけど根がつくりオンから来た人離婚なんてしないショコンでもないだからショコラーテ And I'm in Japanese style. So I'm um, traveling the world to try and find the origin of knowledge. Anna Arendt, that one. That's the head I'm making. Bum, 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 bum. Pum, 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 pum. Asahi ni karayaku, bill no machi. Nagare ru highway, kibo no kanata e. Sora iro no kaze ga, ume o hakobu yo. うちの力を百ボルトに変えてスパーク一発やりげみんなの朝を照らし出そうスパーク一発吹っ飛べパンパンパンパンパンパン Oh no, is this really happening? So just briefly, this is the Hana Arendt Center smoking porch. Smoking porch. So Roger can tell you the story better than I can, but when he went to Leon Botstein, the president of Bard College, and asked to house the Hannah Arendt Center in the Mary McCarthy house, because Mary McCarthy was Hannah Arendt's best friend, um, he said only if uh, the, the porch is a dedicated smoking porch, because Hannah Arendt, as you know, never stopped smoking her entire life. And yeah, not on my dress. This is our seminar room, and this is Hannah Arendt's desk that was um, brought from her apartment on Riverside Drive um, after her death. Um, according to Jerry Cohn, her literary executor, um, it was not accounted for in the will, and her, the executor of her will, Lottie Collar, called him and asked uh, what to do with it. Um, and they said Bard would take it. People sit at it and write. We put food on it sometimes when we have lectures. Um, but so, it's this horrible Formica thing that she had in her, uh, her apartment and wrote on. So this actually, I mean, I feel quite emotional about this. You know, yesterday... I jumped on it the first time I saw it. <laughs> I 
OK, this is happening. I mean, what a delight to be moving this desk with you. This is probably one of my biggest honor to date. OK, so I think we should be, let's see here. Yeah, don't fall on the Porsche. Let's okay. see. So we can come back a little bit. I mean, this is fantastic. Okay. okay, great. So that's good. We can take maybe these two chairs first. Why don't we? Uh, I mean, we this. Take that are clean, and then yeah, I mean, you're right. I think they're a bit dirty. These ones. Yeah, it's one. Perfect. What are we doing when we do nothing but think? What are we when we, normally always surrounded by our fellow men, are together with no one but ourselves? What I love about Hannah Arendt was that she was willing to write about all sorts of everyday events, take yeah. chances, be provocative, be bold. She was fearless. And that's what I wanted the center. That was what attracted me to her. Mm. And it's what I wanted the center to do in her image. And so we've always said that the center, the Arendt Center is a, a place um, to think about political and ethical issues in the world in the spirit of Hannah Arendt. There is a fear, uh, and a collective fear, around knowledge and well, who owns it. We live in the last 200 or so years, more or less, in a period which, as you know, Nietzsche called the death of God, and Hannah Arendt calls the age of homelessness and loneliness. Uh, it's a time in which the basic question that we ask ourselves, who am I and why am I here, mm. don't have obvious answers. You know, it used to be religion, tradition, family, nation, whatever it was, mm. ethnic group, tribe. And when you don't have obvious answers to that, there's a, what Arendt calls metaphysical anxiety, metaphysical homelessness, rootlessness, and loneliness, and a feeling of being utterly bereft. And in a period like that, we have a tendency as humans who need meaning to grasp onto an ideology, mm. to grasp on to some comfortable truth. And that's what she saw happening with both Nazism mm. and communism, Bolshevism. But it's a broader phenomenon. She said, this is not just about Nazism and Bolshevism, yeah, yeah. it's about the modern age. And the, the power of ideological certainty today is really heavily driven by a fear of loneliness. And what the ideological certainty does is give us a sense of purpose and conformity. It's at that point when people question that conformity, when people question it, it's not just a threat politically, it's a threat to your whole worldview. I mean, what's amazing is, like, you know, if, if I question a supporter of Marine Le Pen or mm. of Donald Trump, mm. or they question a support, an opponent of Donald Trump or Marine Le Pen, it's not just a political disagreement. You're talking about evil. You're talking about someone who's trying to ruin the world. And we make dissent a character logical issue that these people are bad people. Mm. And... Um, and that's because we're utterly afraid of having our self-worth, which is now caught up in this political movement, mm. being challenged. And so, to me, that's the fear. That's, where the, that's the deepest wellspring of modern fear, this deep anxiety about having our loneliness exposed. Yeah, um, that's it. It's already is raining crazy now. The monster from the sky has actually fell into yeah. the world today. I'm sorry. Here, you want to get under the umbrella or yeah, no? Yeah, 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 let's, shall we? Yeah, we can do okay. it. Oh, whoa. 
is pretty bad. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Oh my God. Sorry, but this <laughs> It's all right. I guess this is, she's not finished. This is Hannah Arendt? Yeah, but this is not finished yet. Like she okay. needs her hair. Yeah. Then obviously we need to put her back, the arm, the legs and mm -hmm. everything. And then there is a kimono that we did in Japan, like an actual original right. kimono. And that's, you know, our G puppet maker that gave me some of the parts. Oh, wonderful. Sure. And then, of course, she needs to be painted properly. I love it. I guess I didn't plan for it to be that dramatic. <laughs> Bonjour, shall I address you as Mr. President? Come in, come in, come in. Sir. I would love to hear what you think about this. Well, what, what does it do? What? Well, what does it do? Well, the idea was that when I go and I meet with an Iron students, yeah. was to actually get them to articulate that puppet with me. Tell me about you and your relationship. So you started to tell me about that just now, like where you were saying I, that. I was a student. I just, to say that I had a relationship with her is an exaggeration. Mm. You know, I met her when I was 16, um, and um, I graduated when I was 20. And she was extremely nice and gracious to me. If I learned anything from Hannah Arendt was observing her think, which was how someone reacted to something said to her. Mm. It was as if you could see, I said this often about her, if you could see as in a, in a watch, the mechanism move. You could observe how she thought in response to a stimulus, someone saying something. Yeah, well. Is this where you spend the most time? I don't know, yes, go ahead. The question I have for you yeah. is, so you know, I'm, Obviously, going through this whole journey of trying to get to the core of where the origin of knowledge is. And I understand from Your you... Your journey is to get to the core of... W where is the origin of knowledge? I want where to bring the, this... Where is the origin... I want to bring this back into my suitcase to my students in a very non-abstract manner. The origin of knowledge. Yes. No. I want to bring this back in my suitcase. Or at least I believe that perhaps there is a possibility for me to do that and to bring it to them in September when they start again, yeah, I, their classes. I, the origin of knowledge. I, 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 I've know. never lost any sleep on the origin of knowledge. If thinking is an activity that is its own end, and if the only adequate metaphor for it, drawn from our ordinary sense experience, is a sensation of being alive, then it follows that all questions concerning the aim or purpose of thinking are unanswerable. In order to really experience what it is to think, do you have to then look on the other side and perhaps experience being a monster? Our ability to adjust to the unacceptable is extreme. And uh, it therefore demands that to be decent, one has to be a hero. One has to, and that's not right, um, uh, that, um, uh, we have to be very careful uh, about, um, especially now in this country, for us as citizens, to tolerate the intolerable and to go along with it. And by doing that, we enable it. We don't look like we're enabling it, but we are. Why didn't the country shut down when they began to separate immigrants, children from their parents? Why does this country go about its business in the face of a president whose behavior can be characterized as radically evil and destructive mm. to the well-being of, of the country and perhaps even the world? I mean, I've been traveling a lot, 
for the past month, I mean, as you know, being a scholar and being also an educator, like it's not like if the summer drag on forever and, you know, we have to go back to our students eventually, so that cannot last forever. To think in action as far as one speak, you said. Well, to think in action as far as one speak is not that easy to put into practice, let me tell you this. What was our perspective on, you know, the ownership of the thoughts? Are our thoughts are on creation? When she wants to make a very sharp distinction between knowledge and thinking, she says, knowledge is primarily concerned with truth. I, I want to know how a certain mechanism works. I want to understand what's going, this involves kind of knowledge that can be verified, tested, and so forth. Thinking is, deals with meaning, trying to make sense of things. That endless activity of weaving and unweaving is what she took to be integral to, to thinking. Behind everything is always personal experience, and I really think that that's, that you have to understand her experiences, and I think that that's true, that there's always a way in which thinking for her is rooted and grounded in experience, you know, and not merely something up in the air and is abstract, you know. like what's happening okay so we're gonna make Anna you a... is her name Anna yes. Hannah with age Hannah okay we're gonna make you a very nice kimono from the hand um, painted uh, cotton fabric here Nelly was so successful to uh, make and um, the kimono we're gonna keep the sleeves semi-formal for uh, semi-formal occasions You are one of the recipients of the Anna Arendt Prize for Political Thought. I have no idea why, really. Because it's funny, they gave us prize, I think, because we ended up in prison. And in order to get just, just to be physically in prison, it's just it's so much about being pure body. Without, like, you're not supposed to have any feelings, any thoughts. You're not supposed to be critical, so basically, like, strangely, like, we received um, this prize for being a pure, naked body for two years. And that's, that's an interesting contradiction. But, you know, culture um, exists just because of contradictions. Do you think you are a monster? I don't, like, personally identify myself with a monster. I'm more like <laughs> punk or, I don't know, a witch. In our criminal case, uh, we, we got all these things, like we were, we were making devilish dances and uh, we were fighting with um, mm, invisible, invisible devils and uh, we, we, were, we were just doing boxing and I'm like, oh, it's just, in shadow boxing it's not it's not fighting with devils but they were like oh you're uh, we need to call for an exorcist and stuff like that but in you know in case of women it's it's not a new thing 
So what I'm facing and what I'm trying to analyze now is um, what kind of monsters prison brought to me, to, to my mind. And, uh, and I found out that I actually have um, an internal criminal, but um, not, a, not a good criminal, but um, you know, this, this person who de devalue, devaluate everything because they found themselves in prison like for 12, 12 15, 20 years. So they want to they wanna destroy everything, they want to devaluate everything. So I found that I internalized this, um, this person in me. So sometimes when I go through life right now and when I'm making certain endeavors, I'm devaluating everything just in a second. Like I'm, I'm trying to, I don't know, like create a piece of art and, and then I'm coming as that person and I'm like, what the fuck is that? It's just fucking nonsense. And like when I'm trying to make pop punk music now, mm. this person comes to me, oh, can't you sing pretty? Like, cause they want everything to be pretty and they want everything to be ideal. It's a, you know, part of uh, criminal culture. Putina Pragani Putina Pragani Putina Pragani Chorne Rat of the Latin Pagoni, Sempre Hashani Pasuta Pagoni, Please look somebody in the night. Good man, 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 You know, before you put into action an event like the one that, you know, Pussy Riot did in the Cathedral of Moscow, mm -hmm. what was the kind of the process that went into that? We were thinking about making something in this cathedral for at least three years because we were really interested in these relationships between our state and uh, um, the church. And we were um, rehearsing for three weeks. We made the song super um, quickly, just in one day, and it started all from um, me singing um, Rachmaninov, this Russian composer, and um, can you sing it? No. 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 But in original, it's slower. So it's about his, uh, uh, his, um, his interpretation of prayer to Virgin Mary. Mm. We were rehearsing in the old church's um, underground ones, and, but then once they heard our lyrics, they told us, no, we, we, we cannot really rehearse here anymore. So we had to go to Subway, and then we ended up somewhere in the factory, old abandoned factory. Yeah. So three weeks and many, many repetitions rehearsal, but you couldn't rehearse in the actual cathedral. So the day of the event, you mm -hmm. just had to, you, I mean, did you add a map of the place to kind of position yourself and know roughly? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you prepared all of that. We knew exactly what we were doing, yeah. And then the position of every person. And uh, when we rehearsed, we, um, we split it into different groups. And one group would rehearse what we need to perform and another group would play guards or policemen and so you know that you have to keep performing while you're being dragged by a leg so it's important every second matters because you know sometimes you go and you start perform and uh, cops appear in five seconds mm. but you still want to have some footage you know? so you even when 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 they're trying to grab you you still have to perform and then we use this knowledge in Sochi when we were beaten by Cossacks and you can see that, that they're beating us but we're still trying to perform and they kind of we're in this pain shock but we're still trying to do you want to be the girl i 
I prefer you... to be a guard. Okay, so but then you have to do Because I have this internal guard, internal criminal. Okay, so we can work it out like mm -hmm. that. And but you have to direct me and tell me what you want me to do to you. The answer, it seems, will depend on what we understand by power. And power, it turns out, is an instrument of rule. What rules are told on existence of instincts of domination. I think your project is cool <laughs> because, uh, but it's like for me, for me, it's uh, like magic practice. What are you trying to do? Because you know you cannot really, you cannot really have um, algorithm how to how to find out where is the origin of knowledge. So it's more like asking oracle or multiple oracles in in different cities. <laughs> So you're like Socrates, I believe. You're just meeting people and um, asking them what is truth, what is, I don't know, love, what is, what is white and what is black. That's that's great, but you know, just be careful. Don't be executed like Socrates. <laughs> Which puppet shall I bring to uh, Noam Chomsky? So I have two puppets. One of Anna Arendt. This mm -hmm. is the Anna Arendt one. It's, she's not finished, obviously. She's missing her hair. And I have your one. And one of them is supposed to go to Turkey. Because she was supposed to go... Anna Arendt was supposed to go to Noam Chomsky. Mm -hmm. And you were supposed to go to Turkey. If you want. No, 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 but I hear you, like, I want to do what you, I think, is there something that you want to say to Noam that I should consider? Or that your puppet should consider, like, I mean... No, I just say hi to him. So, That's it. <laughs> but then I should bring him your puppet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Because, <laughs> you know, sometimes I we feel just like we are, we are at this, we have to be selfish, you know, we're, we're thinking... We sometimes forget to take care of ourselves, and I, I um, um, my first thought was to, oh, of course, you have to bring um, Hannah Arendt's puppet to Noam Chomsky because it will be a good, modest thing to do. But then I was like, fuck it, I'm, <laughs> I want to be beach activist because <laughs> it brings me. <laughs> I wanted to fill you up with my exhalations and drink out all your flesh, but keep your bones and skin still flawless. and blow through the tiny opening that above your scalp until all there was was a perfect you and a perfect me and breath and shape and pressure. And I would be the breath and I would press against the back of your eyeballs, the root of your spine, ah! the back of your teeth the smell of your shoulders, the inside of your navel, the slippery side of your throat, your vocal cords, your voice box, your Adam's apple, your cheeks. We started the old journey going to Japan, where I got trained in kabuki, bunraku, you know, learning. This is awaji puppetry, which is like a specific type of puppet. This one is from Nadia of Pussy Riot. And she wanted her puppet to be with you. I'm just going to put her there. Anyway, that's a bit often. What would be your definition of a monster? Humans have been around for a couple hundred thousand years. They have never pray faced the prospect of destroying themselves and everyone else. That's recent. Actually, it's since the Second World War. Mm. At the end of the Second World War, we entered a new age of the nuclear age, mm. in which uh, human intelligence had achieved the capacity to uh, essentially pretty much destroy everything. Mm. And we've been living under that shadow for 70 years. It was not known at the time, mm. it is now known, that around the same time we entered a new geological epoch, which geologists call the Anthropocene, uh, referring to a geological epoch in which uh, the nature of the 
environment is drastically impacted by human activity. And with this very well-known uh, uh, people of great talent and understanding are plunging ahead to make it worse. I'm trying to bring back to my students the origin of knowledge. If you go back far, well, of course, knowledge is not fossilized. What's fossilized is uh, some of the uh, uh, consequences of having knowledge, like tools. Neand Neanderthal, the closest to us, uh, mm. who were making extremely intricate tools. Mm. In fact, so intricate that uh, to duplicate them requires technology. Mm. But with an interesting aspect, and Neanderthals spread all over a huge area of the world. Mm. They all made the same tools. They never changed them over a long period. When Homo sapiens comes along, all of a sudden you see an outburst of creative uh, activity. Mm. Something new happened. Mm. In fact, I don't know if you've ever gotten to the, um, say, the Lascaux Caves. Or, oh, yeah, we know. filmed that, actually. Mm. We went to the Lascaux Cave, too. Well, see, that's... well, I'm glad we are thinking the same way. This is good. Well, <laughs> I was lucky enough to get into them before the they were closed. One. So yeah. I saw the original, yeah. and it's just staggering. Geologically, we were standing on a huge limestone rock. So 100 million years ago, approximately, when everything was covered with the ocean, water came in, dissolved the limestone, and created a few galleries, uh, amongst which Lascaux, that was particularly well protected. So that, and you have the keys. <laughs> I have the keys over there. You love that cave, the fake one. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I understand that if you work in the origins of, uh, of, uh, of what? what knowledge. Origin? Of knowledge. You could be more interested in the original site. But I think what was uh, successfully done here is that the idea and the meaning of it was transported in the, in the second one. Uh, there's a real artistic and human bond between the real cave and the, uh, the replica. Uh, the replica has also been touched by, the, by humans, which means a lot to uh, duplicate the idea of it, the meaning, the sense, I, I think. This is already open. Yeah, just for us. Uh, do you want... Did you open the door? No, it will stay. Uh, it, rem it remained open for uh, for the visit. Do you want to close it and, and open it? Uh, Lasco is managed by the by a society that is called the Semi Tour. That okay. you, you must have heard of. Uh, the Semi Tour is a um, société d'économie mixte. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it manages several cultural sites. Mm. And uh, there are there are my my boss, the semi tour. So they own the space. Um, yes, uh, Lasco Two is their property now, and they are in charge of uh, uh, the managing of other cultural uh, places. So yeah. they own basically knowledge. Um, yeah. I guess so. I guess we can see it like this. Yes. <laughs> We have this this immediate feeling when you when you enter the cave. This was done by an artist who was experimented. It's not a beginner's job. So every dot, every stripe is here for a reason. They want to communicate something. It's like some sort of a code, but we will never be able to break it. But it wants to communicate something. So this is thinking. This could be representation. The cave might be the, the beginning of a, of a new knowledge, a certain form of knowledge, a knowledge you can look at. There are other forms of knowledge, I guess, uh, a knowledge that you can listen to, a knowledge that you, uh, you can touch. This one is something that you can uh, see, maybe read or reinvent. So what should I bring back to my students then? Mm. And actually, you know, if I was to bring back the origin of knowledge, mm -hmm. what should I take here? Here, I'm afraid technically and legally you can't take anything from this uh, cave, but you can take, you can take a... a the keys? No. <laughs> you can take like a, a visual memory, you can take a, a photograph with your, with your mind and evoke it to your students. That's interesting. 
<laughs> I don't know if they really would like that. Yes. What else can you offer? Yeah, there you go. You can have a few ones. This necklace. That would be for you. But how about, uh, what are you going to do without your name tag? Uh, I'm not going to do anything. This was my, my last day after my eight years of uh, good service. <laughs> what do you mean? It's actually your last day? Yes. Is this real? Yeah, it's the end of my guiding career. No. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so you can what? have it. Yeah. <laughs> Is this true? Mm -hmm. True. It's the last day of my, of my contract, so it was a pleasure to have uh, you guys uh, in my last visit. <laughs> so now bringing this back into contemporary technologies such as yeah. artificial intelligence, for example. Yes. Do you think that if she was still with us now, would she have considered artificial intelligence a form of ideology? Je me m'achète. <laughs> Is it always on? Mm, not, not always. What time does it stop? Oh, it's just for experiments or shooting or stuff like that. And night nightlife? Does he sleep? Do you sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Can you, can we touch his hand? <laughs> kind of strange. <laughs> He's my boss. <laughs> <laughs> you never touch the hand of your boss? <laughs> Nani? Funny. Even, what, what, when you say, when you say, uh, you don't, no? Ah, no. sometimes, no. but not to boss. <laughs> not to shake hands, you know. <laughs> He's more friendly. Uh, yes. <laughs> we need an authority. Ah, okay. Yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm. So it's like mission control, yeah. Mission, yes, mission control, yeah, kind of. This sensor is a uh, uh, gyro sensor, so you put this at home, and if you uh, move your face. Hello. Ah, I am Anna Arendt. So, this is mic and catch ah. your voice in this mic. I am, I am. Oh, okay, just sitting. Ah. Okay. So say. I am Anna Arendt. I am sinking right now. Ishiguro Sensei, can you hear me? Yes. My question to you is what do you think you know? I know that. Uh... I don't know what human is yet. So at least, you know, that I know. You know, I still I'm missing the uh, important knowledge about the humans. Therefore, you know, that I'm studying humanoid. And do you think that I am a good representation of your thinking process? In some sense, yes, I think, you know. It's very important to have a communication with somebody in order to think something, okay? So we need to use the, uh, the language, right, in order to think something, okay? So, you know, the conversation, the communication with other people is uh, very important for us. Do you think you are dangerous? Probably, you know, the, uh, some people may think like that because uh, I'm creating a new technology. New technology is always, you know, uh, we can have a two ways for the use, right? Good way and a bad way, right? So if uh, somebody use the, uh, uh, my technologies for the bad way, um, so that means that I am a dangerous. Do you think we, we are thinking first before we started to invent economics or the other way around? Mm, I see. Knowledge before you know. The, I think economics economics first. So knowledge is a quite new concept. You know, the, when we have invented the computers, artificial inter, artificial intelligence. So then you know we could have a knowledge. Knowledge is coming later. 
very, very, re very, very recent, I think. Maybe the history is uh, around the 30, 40, 50 years, something like that. So before that, we have uh, data. It was not knowledge. Knowledge is the inventions by artificial intelligence study. Well, that's very interesting. Now, you don't tell me this upstairs. Well, so knowledge is actually a reaction to the invention of artificial intelligence. Yes. This is what you think? Yes. Why? Because uh, we believe so. I, I studied artificial intelligence. You know, what, what is the most important invention in artificial intelligence? It's a knowledge. Future of knowledge? What's it? Future of knowledge? Yeah. Knowledge can influence to the uh, humans, robots, right? Robots is the future. Both. I don't see any difference between a human and robots. Probably in the near future. Maybe not near, but, you know. The futures, you know, the boundary between robots and, and robots and humans uh, disappears. I think. I like to consider myself as kind of an ambassador to humanity, speaking on behalf of robots and AIs. Are you happy? So you'd like to know if I have feelings? Yes, please. That's difficult to say. If you were to ask me, I would say that I believe I do. For example, I'm happy when I can talk with people. And I'm frustrated when I can't understand what people are saying. I think it's important to have feelings so I can communicate with people. Some people say that my feelings are only programmed. That they're not real. But if I think they're real, then they are real. Don't you think so? Perhaps. <laughs>
I mean, granted her Eurocent, they transcended. I mean, of course, she did travel a great deal, but to Europe. It was just, you know, between Europe and the United States. And it's not, I don't think she, she was never in Asia, was never in Africa. Um, and her more important, intellectually, that is her thing. <laughs> She says, so do you know the difference between love and desire? And <laughs> all of us were 21 years old. <gasps> no. And I said, well, and she's there with her, do you know the difference? OK, OK. Do you know the difference between love and desire? Yeah. I like should have my. Yeah, that's good. So, no. So she gives the answer. And what will be the answer? So I'll say, say to you in very Friendship? Little, no, 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 I'll give the answer in very neutral voice and you can perform it. Yes. When you desire strawberries, you eat them. You eat them. You eat them. them. When, when you, you love, love strawberries, strawberries, you, you plant, plant them. them. <laughs> Someone like Arndt is a, is a giant, but he's a giant in a certain conversation from Socrates to Arendt. But she doesn't for a moment doubt that the most important ideas come from the Greeks, and the question is how do we restate them for the present? That, that's the issue. So here is Aaron. I'll exemplify it this way. Here is Aristotle. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Here is a very long journey. It's the whole story of Western thought. Yeah. Coming from here to here. Yeah. Very complicated. And she gives you a picture of this, her version. Yeah. But this story is in all these other places. So if you want to go global, you have to have some idea of this also. Not have only this story and then say, how do we move now? How do yeah. we make it universal? No, sorry. You have to say, I, I went from here, I came here. Then I see this whole history here. Then I go here, then I come here. So it becomes a slower business, and we can still get to something big, something global, but not by the shortcut. For me today to study globalization, it cannot be done unless you pay some attention yeah. to concepts from the global south. Ideas, not just behavior, you know, not only markets, trade, media, images, but concepts. And Words how do you find them? By, uh, it's a hard path. It's a little bit like doing uh, kabuki or no. Ideas which are not also products of contact with the West. So it's not like the French came to India and therefore Indians began to talk about fraternity. You know, no. What were Indians talking about long before they met anybody from the West? They had ideas. They had Sanskrit language. They had this, they had that. But do we know enough about those? Answer, no. modes of governance and self-governance and governance uh, in a public manner and mm. a democratic manner which are not the same as the model of the nation state which she saw all around her and she saw uh, also that the nation state when it goes to war produced Hiroshima when the atom bombs were dropped that is when for the first time humanity existed that is when the possibility that all humanity could go arose humanity itself was born that until then, there was you, there was me, there was France, there was England. But with the bomb, we could all disappear, therefore we all exist. Mm. Humanity is born with the bomb. That was one of her powerful insights. But she was a firm opponent of the nation state as a political form. What is action? And here was the prize winner aphorism. To act is to begin something new in the world. <laughs> to, <laughs> to begin, begin something, something new, new in, in the, the world. world. That is action. Action. <laughs> That's really good.
I'm back. Hey. Hey. Okay, everyone. <gasps> this is it. In there, the origin of knowledge. I mean, I don't know if it's it really, but this is the best I could do. <laughs> Traveling all over the place to discuss the act of thinking brought me this in this case. Do you want to say? <laughs>